Well, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Catherine for uh, inviting me to take part in this uh, webinar. Uh, and then of course, I wanna thank uh, al -Qaeda for uh, assisting me with the technology. Yesterday, we spent actually a fair bit of time <laughs> working on different permutation for getting this uh, presentation to work. And I'm glad to, uh, uh, we, we're on board right now. So I, what I wanna do uh, in the next half hour is go over some of the uh, lessons we have learned, if you will, from a uh, um, research network uh, that was conducted over the last few years. Some of the lessons we learned about uh, open science, open access, and openness in general. And I'd like to uh, see if we could derive some of these lessons to our current understanding of open access and how we can think about open access differently, uh, particularly with regard to uh, different contexts uh, in a different part of the world, uh, where the institutional, political, economic situations are very different from um, many of us who, who do work in the global north. And I also want to preface the, the term global self uh, by saying that uh, I guess many of us in the past, myself included, uh, have used the term developing countries and we have gradually shifted over to the term global self uh, because the growing realization that uh, we have tended to focus too much on uh, aspects of development and focus on economics rather than on many other aspects of uh, societal needs. And Global South is a reminder that uh, we live in a highly unequal world uh, where uh, particularly with regard to knowledge productions, uh, there are a system of hierarchy and, and power uh, that continue to dominate the, the system of uh, knowledge production and continue to marginalize uh, many countries uh, in the periphery, um, particularly those who were uh, colonized in the past. And so there's a historical legacy that is implied in the term global self, and particularly a, a reference uh, explicitly to uh, unequal power structures. Uh, that is very much at the heart of what we want to do in terms of understanding open access and open science and what openness could do. Uh, and so uh, I want to uh, preface that because that is important as part of the motivations uh, and it will contribute toward our understanding of, uh, of how we can rethink uh, open assets, uh, assets for the future uh, in terms of uh, how we could collaborate uh, on a, a truly global uh, in, inclusive uh, infrastructure. And again, I will have lots of questions that I will be raising. Uh, and again, the, I, the idea is that, that really no one has the answer. And, and this kind of dialogue is important because we really do want to have uh, collaboration going forward in terms of uh, relying on a particular models because we do need a diversity of, of, of ideas and models to work with. So a little bit of background about the Open and Collaborative Science and Development Network. Uh, we have actually just wrapped up our official face of the, the, the network uh, in December, and we're still in the process of synthesizing uh, a lot of the research findings that uh, we have been doing. Uh, we want to acknowledge the funding agency, IDRC in Canada, and DFID in the UK in particular, uh, and our partner, the key partner of IHUB Research based in Nairobi, uh, in Kenya. Um, this network uh, has a really overarching goal of trying to understand uh, what we mean by open and collaborative science and particularly under what conditions uh, could these type of practices and thinking uh, lead to real differences uh, in various forms of uh, social outcomes uh, in, the, in the global south. And now, um, there are a number of definitions of open science out there, and this one is uh, widely uh, circulated uh, and is a good operational definition, but then I'll come to the limitation of this particular definition later on. Uh, this definition uh, suggests that open science really opening up the whole entire research uh, life cycle so that people could contribute and collaborate uh, all through the process 
uh, from conceiving of research ideas to experimentation to data gathering to, of course, publication even and then peer review and post peer review. All those could, in theory, uh, be opened up so that uh, this is a, a conventional view of the, uh, uh, the, the, the research life cycle. And you can see in every stage now there are ways for us to open up the process to allow collaboration to take part uh, throughout. Uh, and so this is sort of the general idea, ideal of open, open science. Uh, and of course, open access is a key component of it uh, uh, and has been uh, sort of the driving force behind some of the thinking about open science in particular. Uh, and for us, uh, in, uh, for the OCSD net, we want to know if these type of uh, uh, practices uh, could lead to different way of thinking about uh, knowledge redistribution, knowledge production, and of course, as a result, uh, addresses issues that have traditionally been uh, in, uh, under uh, emphasized in terms of how marginalized communities uh, are not benefiting from a lot of the research that's being done. Uh, so how do, how do we ensure that research uh, not, not only are accessible, but also how could we ensure that the right kind of research is being done uh, and done with the, with the communities, uh, not only on the communities, but with the people in the community so that the outcomes of those research could best serve community needs. So the OCSD net uh, have within it 12 different research projects that were carried out simultaneously uh, in many different parts of the global south, as you can see a very rough diagram here. Uh, and you can go to our website and see uh, a lot of details about each of the projects. Uh, there is a new book coming out based on all these research, and it's just, the new book will be coming out uh, this fall. Uh, I'm sure you can follow on Twitter and find out details about it. Of course, the book will be open access. Uh, a lot of the writings that we've been doing is also on our website uh, as forms of blogs. And you can see that these different projects are pretty diverse in nature. Some of them uh, are working with indigenous communities, some of them working with uh, farmers, some of them working with actually with school children uh, in different parts of the world to understand how they create knowledge, how do, how do they access knowledge, but how do they create knowledge so that those knowledge could serve community needs. Uh, and so if you again you go to our website you will see uh, different practices working with community groups through environmental activism, also uh, working with uh, community uh, people, understanding uh, the quality of their uh, water and their environment, uh, and working with school children in Kyrgyzstan, or, uh, understanding their own social ecologies and how that could contribute to the curriculum. Uh, and our partners in West Africa has been looking at issues of um, uh, access and cognitive justice, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, and these, these different research projects from around the world really help us think about the diversity of needs uh, of different communities and the historical constraints that's been placed on them in terms of uh, access to knowledge and who has the power to create knowledge and kind of what knowledge uh, gets circulated in the end. Uh, so those, those, those are the underlying motivations. Uh, and personally, uh, uh, one that motivated me for a long time in terms of trying to understand this whole issue of uh, the global power structures of knowledge production has been uh, the, the idea that uh, how we see the world in terms of knowledge legitimacies and knowledge production has largely been filtered through specific types of lens. Uh, and, and the lenses that we use uh, often uh, constrain the way we see uh, knowledge. And in this particular map, it is a, a, a representation of a knowledge production as seen through citation uh, and uh, the journal impact factor uh, by uh, the uh, ISI. Um, data is a few years old, but I think uh, much of this is still uh, fairly relevant today. And you can see the stark contrast between uh, the North and the South in terms of uh, knowledge production, but again, that's only seen through uh, the lenses of uh, journal impact factor. 
And so what motivated us is that what would if what if we were to get rid of these lenses? What if we were to use different types of lenses, lenses that are more relevant to uh, different places and different contexts? What kind of world would we see instead? And so, so this is a question that's been the center of our research, and you know whether uh, uh, the whole issue of openness could allow us to rethink. Uh, the nature of, of the power structure currently, where Global North serves at the center of knowledge production and then uh, and then transferring the knowledge to other parts of the world. Uh, that's traditionally been the development model. That is the whole issue that, oh, people in the South, they're, they're starving for knowledge. Uh, open access will allow them to access our knowledge and therefore they will become just like us. They will become developed. Uh, that was the old model. Uh, and the web, when the web came along, we were all very enthusiastic that, well, the, the open web uh, is, embodies the idea there's really no center and no margins. At least, again, I said the ideal. And so the web, as you will recall from the Budapest Open Access Initiative, was something that we frame at the center. That is, it's the web and the old tradition of scholarly uh, communications of, of, of give, giving in terms of peer review and, and, and the final output of knowledge, uh, that has been the, 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 the ethos of scholarly communications. Uh, and the ethos of scholarly communication of giving our labor for each other uh, and the web combined allow us to rethink uh, the whole nature of um, knowledge distribution and knowledge production. So again, that's been at the center of our research for the last uh, little while. And uh, along the way, we have many questions. Uh, many of them, of course, are still unanswered. They're still work in progress. Uh, but they are questions that uh, we need to raise because I think that when we, uh, back in 20 years ago, talking about open access, we were very much focused on, again, the issue of access. You know, are people getting uh, free access and very free access to the journal articles. Uh, we weren't asking enough questions about power relationship. We weren't asking enough questions about who set the rules and uh, who, who create the, the playing fields and who control uh, what gets published and what doesn't get published. We were too concerned about uh, access, but we weren't concerned enough about the, the whole modes of productions and circulation of knowledge. So these are the kind of questions that we, we want to uh, bring to the fore because they do have important implication in terms of how we design and rethink the whole uh, scholarly infrastructure issue. Uh, again, if we don't question these, uh, we will continue to uh, build on past system, past infrastructure that will continue to structure and reproduce the inequalities that we've seen uh, today. So we need to rethink that foundation. Uh, and to do so, we need to think about how openness uh, could rethink, uh, uh, help us rethink uh, uh, innovations and knowledge as public goods, and how can we then uh, rethink policy uh, that could support truly open and equitable infrastructures. So we need to move beyond uh, our focus on journal articles, on journals per se, uh, and on impact factors and on, on, on citation and sort of narrow definition of quality. Uh, and, and again, this is not new, uh, but it is for, uh, and, and, but we're glad that we have now documented many, many examples through our research, uh, why these issues are not, uh, open access uh, alone is not enough. We need to broaden the debate and discussion about what openness really means. Uh, and we need to go beyond uh, what's been you know, regular, referred to as formal knowledge, not, uh, the papers, articles that are published in peer-reviewed journals are uh, traditionally seen as sort of the gold standard. Uh, but working with many different communities around the world, and again, this is, this is not just our observation, these are observations being made by people working in communities for years now, that uh, academic knowledge really represent a small percentage of the whole global production of knowledge, 
maybe a few percentage of all knowledge that reside uh, in the world. And most of the knowledge are generated by communities, community members that reside locally uh, in many different forms, in different languages, in different uh, epistemology, in different cultural tradition, in different worldviews, and so forth. Uh, but our system of production only favors a very, very narrow set of, of worldviews, uh, the Western view of science in particular, that, that, that privilege a certain way of knowing. And so uh, uh, our research, but also really rediscovering of other research and scholars around the world uh, in different fields reminded us that there are lots and lot of, lots of knowledge out there. Uh, we just have not been thinking enough about them. And so if you want to think about a really truly global commons, uh, that is really beneficial to communities uh, and not only the elites uh, in, in world university, uh, we really need to rethink what knowledge is and whose knowledge really matters. And I'm glad to see there are many, many groups, movement, communities uh, that are working on similar issues. and. We need to connect more across these communities. Uh, in the past, one of the things that, uh, that, that were uh, insufficient when we were talking about open access, we tend to talk among ourselves. Uh, we talk now more with people uh, in the open educational resource field. We've now talked with more people in the creative commons communities. We talk with people in the open source community, but those still are not enough. Those are still, the, what I say, the usual suspect. We need to broaden our communities to include many, many different communities, movements, people that we do not traditionally think of part of the knowledge community, but they are everywhere. And so uh, when we think about openness, then we need to think beyond the traditional definition of open access. Uh, and there are many scholars uh, that have been writing about the importance of not only having access to research and knowledge, but the ability to actually take part in the knowledge production process itself, to make meanings, to make knowledge that are locally uh, uh, generated uh, be uh, used in the community and benefit the community. Uh, and that uh, when we think of collaboration, uh, we want to think about how actually community could actually pro provide a lot of understanding of how their communities works. Uh, how livelihood could be improved and how health, social conditions, and education could actually be better uh, serve the local community if the researchers actually uh, comes into the community and work uh, in a more equal basis uh, with the community members. We tend to, to do research in a very extractive way. We have funding that comes from the big funding agency from the north. We, we parachute into a community, we take the data, and then we leave, and then we publish those papers in uh, uh, closed access journals that the communities themselves don't even uh, get to read or benefit from. So these type of extractive research is highly inequitable uh, and really leave a lot of communities more vulnerable than before they were being researched. And so uh, one of the uh, lessons we learn about uh, openness really is really to question this notion of why would researchers be open to come in and do research but that the communities are not open to any benefit. And so these are the kind of issues that also uh, prompt us to think about this whole notion of cognitive justice. That is, why is it that certain knowledge is being uh, privileged, again, uh, and certain knowledge is being made available uh, and certain knowledge of being deemed illegitimate or inferior, actually, in many cases, so that they are being delegitimized or being marginalized, uh, so that we are actually the one who, who, who actually suffer as, as a global community. When we, when we ignore the richness of different knowledge tradition, we are actually uh, all poor for that. So these are the kind of issues that uh, openness uh, really help us uh, redress. Uh, and it is really about questioning the existing assumptions about what knowledge means. Uh, and unfortunately, in the global north, uh, and unfortunately too is spreading to many parts of the global south, that knowledge is being 
commodified more and more uh, so that they're being traded as if they're just a kind of economic goods instead of a public good. Uh, and we, I think we're all familiar with this particular trend. Uh, a couple of days ago, uh, Dr. Ana Maria Chieto uh, from Mexico, who was behind the Elect Index initiatives this, for the last three decades, was giving us talk at this conference, and I would urge you to, to listen to it. Uh, and, and I'm glad uh, uh, Dominic Babini, who many of you do know as well, uh, has sent out this tweet to remind us that in Latin America, uh, they have long traditions of uh, sharing of knowledge, of treating knowledge as public good and not as, as a form of commodity. And so across uh, Latin American countries, you, you know about Cialos, you know about Elect Index, you know about Claso, and many, many initiatives uh, that are uh, publicly funded to ensure that uh, knowledge is publicly accessible. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Dominique's work, you should just follow her and, and find out the many uh, fantastic things that are happening in Latin America, uh, including uh, this other tweet about uh, the public knowledge projects that have been providing the open journal system where many, many journals from around the world, many of them in Latin American countries, uh, have been uh, using. Now, uh, having said that, though, I think we need to think beyond the no, uh, beyond journal itself, as I said a number of times, uh, because the publishers understand that 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 journal is only one aspect of uh, now increasingly uh, this notion of open science. Uh, that if in fact the whole research life cycle is being opened up uh, from formulation to proposal to experimentations to data gathering to final publication, we need to think beyond the journal itself. Is This is about the whole infrastructure that support research, the whole infrastructure that, that allows communication uh, across discipline, across institutions, and, and around the world. And so if you look at how these infrastructures are now being uh, built and being pursued, uh, and this is one of the projects that we're working on right now, documenting how infrastructures is being uh, bought out by the, the large multinational publishers, in this case, a very well-known Elsevier. Uh, and you will notice that uh, Elsevier have been buying a lot, up a lot of the infrastructures that are now increasingly part of the research life cycle. Many of you are familiar with the buyout of the SSRN, uh, Mendeley, and of course, most recently, uh, they bought out BPress, which is an institutional repository software. And that raised a lot of alarm bell among many institutions because we have tended to think of repository, open repository as the foundation of open access. So what does it mean when, when, when a commercial publisher uh, buy up all these supposedly open infrastructure and then make it part of their own uh, closed system uh, for uh, universities that are able to afford the services. Uh, and I have to say that many universities do want these services because uh, it gives them the ability to extract all, or buy all kinds of data from the providers in terms of their own productivity about research trends and about global uh, rankings and so forth. So with university increasingly being driven by this notion of global university excellence and so forth, these kind of services play very well into universities' design, desire to compete uh, or to, uh, to place themselves in these kind of knowledge hierarchy. Uh, again, as I said earlier, when we look at knowledge production system, uh, we are in fact looking at a system of very, very highly unequal uh, uh, structure. Uh, and in my view, this kind of system uh, where a commercial publisher are able to dominate and provide certain elite institution with services, we are exacerbating this kind of global inequality. We will see the world even more divided in terms of who are the half and who are the half not. And so really incumbent upon us 
this community to think about how we can ensure that infrastructures are open for all uh, and not just for those who can afford these very exclusive uh, services and access. We need to think beyond the academies uh, and we want, need to see open science openness as a commitment uh, to uh, opening up the knowledge process. Uh, and again, I can't emphasize enough the need to include traditionally uh, marginalized, underrepresented so, uh, communities. Uh, and our, our research reminded us uh, that openness is really not just a set of conditions. You know, you have to have this kind of license, you have to have uh, this kind of uh, 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 technical uh, quality and so on and so forth. But it's not to do with that. It has to do with how openness could be uh, situated within a particular uh, community context because we can just cannot dictate what open is for every community uh, and have every uh, way of, of, of uh, producing knowledge. Uh, and so we need to be sensitive to different historical dynamics and political dynamics and sure that really how those process has to be locally relevant, locally driven, uh, and allowing people to have a say about how their knowledge is used and not used. And I think when people are, are taken, uh, people's rights are taken from them and say, well, your knowledge has to be open and your, we, all, we will have access to your knowledge, uh, they become actually more disempowered. Uh, again, this is something that we to be cognizant of. Uh, and going back to the issue of, 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 of uh, different definitions of openness, again, we have been too fixated on different standards and different way of defining quality. And again, most of those standards, more of the technical standards, things like the DOI or ORCIDs and all these things, there are primarily, again, uh, definitions or standards defined by Global North communities. Uh, and then they're being imposed uh, on different part of communication system. Uh, and so we need to be cognizant about who get to make these rules about standards and qualities. And are we ensuring that there are enough voices and other voices that are included in these so-called standard setting? And, and again, there are important implications for thinking about governance, for thinking about infrastructures and thinking about sustainability. Because without thinking about these ideas about who makes the rules, uh, we will then blindly replicate existing system of inequality uh, that I referred to earlier. So we need to have innovative thinking about institution, infrastructures, and sustainability model and policy thinking. And again, I said, I don't have any answers. We don't have a good answer, but I think we need to think broadly about what and how to build different policies for different contexts. I think the worst thing we could do is to say, well, this is the policy that is good for everybody and the whole world should use it. I think this one size fit all approach uh, should be the thing of the past and yet we see it over and over again. So I just want to caution again that. Uh, so, oh, sorry, I just repeated that. Um, so we need to think beyond uh, the whole notion of green and Go open access. Unfortunately, there's so much debate that are wasting time and, and energy about, oh, should we be going to the APC model and not APC and so forth and so forth. And I think uh, that kind of debate about paying pay, uh, really detract us from understanding uh, the broader issues about infrastructures and who is responsible for infrastructures. Now I'm going to move to some some technical suggestions very quickly. So uh, many of you know about this initiative uh, called EpiScience, and it's essentially uh, it's an overlay journal, journal system uh, where uh, the, the 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 journal so called is taking advantage of a pre set of preprints, and then from the preprints uh, they can they can do uh, editorial peer review and so forth until certain paper reach a certain level of, of uh, acceptability and then they will be then sent into uh, a journal or a collection or whatever you want to call it. So the idea is to use preprint server or if you will repository as a foundation for scholarly communication. Uh, again this is not new I mean this is a very very early day of, 
of scholarly uh, of open access that we were hoping to see. You having repository playing a key role in scholarly communication. But over the years, we just tend to think of repository as green open access, it's just to archive preprint or published paper instead of being an essential infrastructure. Uh, recently, uh, a paper was uh, published, and this group, uh, Benedict Fetchers and his group, have written a number of papers. Uh, while their focus is on public uh, European open access platform, again, it's partly in reaction to the EU funding uh, on uh, supporting open science, open cloud, and the, 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 the recent call for tender for public uh, infrastructure uh, for open science and open access, uh, they suggest that we could actually do it ourselves with existing repository uh, infrastructure. Uh, and they, they show you how this type of uh, thing could uh, again, using in uh, repository as the infrastructure and building different types of services, service layers, uh, and then create uh, 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 whatever collection journals you want to call it on top. But the key here is having a community layer of people that oversees the development of step setting the quality uh, standards and, and parameters. Uh, and relevance for different communities. And the idea is that there's not one communities, but many, many communities uh, building on what they need, uh, but using the similar set of infrastructure or a common set of infrastructures and services. Uh, and a couple of days ago, uh, PLOS made an important announcement that uh, now all the submission to plot journals will actually be deposited, deposited in the bioarchive uh, preprint server, uh, and then they will continue to be re review and uh, edit uh, editorial decision will continue, uh, and then it will go into publications uh, afterward. Now, the one that may not go into publication will still stay as a preprint, but the idea is that uh, pre the preprint will be accessed even earlier, uh, but using uh, a preprint server, a repository as an integral part of the scholarly communication process. Again, this is long overdue. This is nothing that we should be, uh, say this is such innovation. Um, and again, I'm not undermining uh, the effort here. I think it's an important milestone because it signified that the communities are ready for this type of, of mindset change. And, and, and I'm, I want to give credit to CORE uh, the, uh, for uh, playing an important role in this changing mindset. Because after all, let's not forget, we have thousands of repositories around the world already. But we have been stuck in this repository 1.0 uh, mindset. And, and I'm glad that uh, CORE convened this next generation uh, repositories working group to work out a set of uh, technical, uh, new set of technical services, but also uh, a set of guiding principles and values that are that have to underlie uh, public infrastructures. And I, I cannot emphasize enough, it is the principles that needs to be put into place, uh, not just the technical standards. And it is the principles that need to guide technical standards not the other way around. We often that technical standard guide our principle and that's get us into all kinds of trouble. And uh, they also, CORE also uh, uh, put out this set of principles and again foundations for how we could think about a, a scholarly commons, a global scholarly commons, again based on a set of uh, common values. Uh, and I'm very glad, too, to see this uh, emphasis on values, uh, on principles. And again, these are the kind of issues that we need to think more about. How do we take these principles uh, and then how do we think about designing technology and infrastructure based on these principles so that we ensure uh, equity and diversity in terms of how knowledge are being produced and distributed. I want to quickly throw in some recent research in this area. A, a slew of a very, very interesting books that came out, all by female scholars of technology, uh, of, of techno science, 
uh, under, underlying the existing technology uh, uh, vacuum in terms of uh, 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 embedding uh, uh, codes and algorithm into technology without really questioning existing inequality uh, of all form of racism, sexism, of xenophobia, and all those kind of things that are built into our algorithm. And I, I'm, I'm concerned that a lot of the algorithms are actually built into our scholarly uh, uh, metrics as well. Uh, and scholarly metrics are also uh, prone to reproducing these kind of inequalities. So I want to uh, use this as an opportunity to say, well, for those who engage in technologies, please read these books and think about how technology is not neutral. Uh, a lot of the technologies already have very, very deeply embedded assumptions about societies and about uh, who gets governed by what and, and, and so forth. So going back to my original uh, diagram about the, the center and periphery, uh, this is just a rethinking, right? So what, what uh, Fetcher's group talk about the European infrastructures, there's no reason to limit it to thinking about European infrastructure. Why not think more broadly as global infrastructure? We already have the repository infrastructure. So how do we, how do we leverage this uh, uh, repository infrastructures? Putting the different uh, technical layer, but more importantly, the community layers, the communities are specific to different regions, different parts and different disciplines to allow us to build a common infrastructures uh, that we could begin uh, to, to, to really open up. So how do we do this together? Uh, again, uh, I made lots of suggestions, and it is now up to us to, to do the collaborate. And uh, having said that, I'm just going to stop here, and uh, hopefully I haven't gone on too long, and there's enough time for questions. Thank you.